Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. In another of my experiments, I've written a bunch, about 500 short, short stories. These are my 368 favorites, and I've read some of these to you before, but I'm trying to do a better job of not just reading them, but performing them. Well, these eight, I'm going to try to perform, see if I do a good job or not. Hopefully you'll enjoy them. The first few are from this book, Dark, short, short stories from the darker side of life. The first story is called Kisser. The doorbell rang at 3 a.m. I opened the door to find a wicker basket. In it, wrapped in a blanket, was a puppy. I work full time. Who has time for a dog? Even if I got a dog sitter, that's expensive. And then there are the nights and the weekends. And the training. Who has time? Who wants pee and poop in the house? So, cute as the puppy was, I steeled myself carried him into the car and drove to the pound. He would not get off my lap. Indeed, the more I drove, the more he curled up in my lap, and then he fell asleep on my lap. Still, I was not going to have a dog. I pulled into the pound's parking lot, saw the entrance. It reminded me of Auschwitz. I pursed my lips and lifted the puppy with one hand and started to reach for the car door with the other, and then, damn it, the puppy licked my face. I just couldn't do it. I closed the car door, yeah, with the puppy and me inside. I named him based on what had just happened. My forever companion would be named Kisser. But if it was one thing I wouldn't let Kisser do is disrupt my sleep. So even before I got home, I went to the pet store, got a crate and a cushion to put inside it. Add the food, the collar, leash, and the tax, and I was out $247. And that was before the vet visit. Kisser was perfectly healthy, but needed spaying and shots, another 300 bucks. I read on the internet how important it is to begin housebreaking immediately and to count on it taking a week. So damn it, I took a week off from work. And every time Kisser got up from his nap, I carried him outside to the pee place and waited and waited. Finally, success. Followed instantly by a treat and massive praise. But despite my diligence, Kisser had a few accidents, including one vomit. But yeah, after a week, he was trained. But Kisser would not sleep in his crate. The first night, I put him in, and within seconds, he was whimpering, the sweetest damn whimper you ever heard. I needed to sleep, so I moved the crate from the kitchen to my bedroom. He still whimpered, and whimpered. At some godforsaken hour, I got up, put a towel on the far corner of my bed. I was not going to have pee or poop on my blanket, and I lowered him onto the towel. He immediately stopped whimpering, curled up, and went to sleep. He was doing a great job of training me. The only thing, by the time I got up in the morning, Kisser was no longer at the foot of the bed. He was curled up around my warmest spot, my crotch. And when I started to get up, he jumped on me, licked my face. We went out, and he did his business like a pro. After a week, I was grateful I had Kisser. I could see why they call a dog a man's best friend. So you can imagine how I felt when after eight days, the doorbell rang. It was a neighbor. She said, I had just gotten a puppy when in the middle of the night, I got a call from a hospital 200 miles away. My dad had had a heart attack. I was frantic. I was so frantic. I forgot to leave you a note and I forgot all about the dog then. My dad died. We had the funeral. And when I came back and saw the crate, I remembered, oh, I am so sorry, so, so sorry. Thank you so much for taking care of my puppy. Can I have him back now? Anyway, that story is called Kisser. The next story is called Spoon. After I finished high school, everyone thought I'd go to Poland's most prestigious college, the University of Warsaw. But my father's fabric business was struggling to stay alive. You see, the Nazi invasion was making even Christians nervous about spending on discretionary items. The town we lived in was safe. No one locked their door. So one day, and yeah, it was 1942, so we shouldn't have been so surprised, there was an unusually loud knock at the door. It was two Nazis in black boots. Unlike in the movies, they didn't yell. One was silent and the other whispered, You will be out of your house with only what you can carry on your back by noon tomorrow or else. The next day at noon, there weren't two Nazis. Four Nazis came to the door again and yelled, Raus! And they dragged my mom, my dad, my sister, and me onto a truck. 
They took us to a place in the forest called Ponari. One Nazi grabbed my sister and dragged her away to a barrack. The other Nazis threw the rest of us into a pit, whereupon they shot most of us to death, including my mother and father. They left a few of us for a reason I was soon to learn. I had rarely cried before, but then I sobbed hard. Then they threw gasoline onto the dead people and used a flamethrower to set them on fire. I threw up. Then they threw shovels and lime into the pit and yelled, Now, you will bury them nice and you will get food. If not, you will go too. That night, we took our spoons, dug a hole under the barbed wire, and escaped. At least we tried. The Nazis shot us all except me. I had managed to run deeper into the forest. For days, I survived only by eating nuts and berries from the trees. Then I saw a cabin in the distance. I was exhausted, but seeing it, I practically ran there. An old woman answered the door, and on seeing me, unshaven, dirty, smelling of something that had burned, she must have been scared. What do you want? I explained that I'm harmless, and still she said, Go away! I had to think of something. I saw her wearing a big cross, and there was a picture of Jesus on her wall. So I said, I'm a priest who the Nazis chased away. Can I bless you? She softened, and I tried to make up some Catholic-sounding blessing. And then she took care of me for three years until the Americans liberated the Jews. I was put on a train to England and then on a cargo boat to Ellis Island, New York City. I didn't have a penny, no education, no family, no English, only the scars of the Holocaust. The only job I could get was shining shoes. I didn't want to do that forever, so I went to night school to learn English. My teacher said I learned quickly and that I should go to college. So I went to Bronx Community College and then City College of New York and then Albert Einstein Medical School. That was 50 years ago. Today, I was looking at the patients I was to see today and I saw my sister's name. I assume she survived Pernari because the Nazis thought she was sexy. Now, both of us were far from sexy. I'm a year from retirement, and she looked even older than I do. And when I saw her chart, I saw why. She was referred to me, a cardiologist, because her primary care doctor diagnosed her with end-stage heart failure. I couldn't wait for her appointment, but was dreading having to confirm the diagnosis. I'll just say that we hugged for 20 minutes. That story is derived from my father's true story, he was one of the men to escape from the Panari death camp where, indeed, he had been forced to bury the Jews that the Nazis shot. It's also true that the men used spoons to dig a tunnel to escape. It's also true that after the war, my father was dumped on a cargo boat and dropped in the Bronx, where the only job he could get was as a factory worker. He went to night school to learn English, and while he did not become a doctor, he made a middle-class living owning a small store in a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn. My dad... Boris Nemko is my greatest inspiration. In any case, that story is called Spoons. Next story, also based on reality, is called A Dose of Reality. It's based on a true story. Only irrelevant details have been changed. Tom got a doctorate in education, and everyone was sure he'd become a professor preparing graduate students for a career as a K-12 through teacher. But in Tom's fieldwork, it was clear to him that he was far from a master teacher. He couldn't even control difficult students. Tom had learned a lot of theory in graduate school, but too little that was practical. So after completing his doctorate, he decided to need to get practical experience to see if he could become a good teacher. So he took a job in one of Boston's high schools that is sanitizingly called Challenged. It soon became clear to Tom that many of the students, especially the active boys, had a hard time sitting through the 50-minute period, and especially the double periods that education experts advocate. So Tom decided that during a double period, he would take his class on a little field trip. The problem was that half the students didn't return the parent permission slip. It wasn't that the parents or guardians weren't willing to sign. The slips too often didn't get to them. Tom's students said that they lost it, their parents were away, and so on. Tom gave him another permission slip, but still many did not come back. So Tom decided to try a trip with all the kids, even if some didn't have a permission slip. He thought, it's just at a nearby tide pool. He rented a 15-person van and packed his class into it. If a bit scrunched, they'd all fit in the van, because while his class size was officially 22, on the average day only 15 would show. Everyone had a great time. 
and to ensure that they were addressing the mandated Common Core curriculum, they discussed and Tom gave assignments that tied the trip to academic learning. So a week later, they did another trip. This time, it was a behind-the-scenes tour of a bakery, another success. Unfortunately, the third time, when the kids were getting into the van, this time to go to a museum, the principal saw them aghast. Mr. Johnson, don't you know that our insurance doesn't cover that? And did you get permission slips from all those parents? Tom murmured no. She pulled him aside and said, I am initiating termination procedures. You are endangering your students. Of course, Tom was scared, sad, but also angry. He wanted a better service students, and as a result, he was getting fired. So that very Friday, he asked his class, who would like to spend the weekend in my apartment with my family? Nearly everyone raised their hand. There wasn't enough room in Tom's apartment for all the students, but his classroom aide volunteered to let some stay with her. The next morning, Tom asked his aide, so how did it go? She said, two of them raped me. Tom lamented not just the loss of his job, but that he had tried so hard to be a good teacher, and his aide was so kind, so patient. How could two of their students do that? How dare they? Tom thought, I'm not sure what to believe anymore. The teachers' union defended Tom, but he lost his job anyway. He thought about taking some innocuous job like clerk in a bookstore, but accepted a job at a university teaching prospective students. In any case, that course, story is called The Dose of Reality. Again, it is an absolutely true story with just irrelevant details changed. This next story is called Dog Stolen Reward. Jessica had a stressful job as a social worker. So, more even than most dog owners, she was glad at the end of the day to get that enthusiastic greeting from her sweet doggy, Bella. Bella had to hold it in all day because Jessica lived in an apartment. So Jessica's first priority was to take Bella for a walk. And to kill two birds with one stone, they made a quick stop at Trader Joe's. She only needed half and half for her beloved morning coffee and spring greens for her daily virtuous salad. As usual, Jessica tied Bella to a post in an inconspicuous place on the side of Trader Joe's. For years, there was never a problem, but today when Jessica returned, Bella was gone. Jessica raced around, drove around, yelling, Bella, to no avail. She constantly checked her cell because Bella's tag listed her phone number and the word reward. Finally, adrenaline dissipated, Jessica plodded back home and got herself a glass of wine to wait out the vigil. The damn thief will call to get his fucking reward. And the thief did. Teresa age 18, single mother of two, struggling to live amid the noise of an SRO, it's a small welfare hotel, felt desperate. So when she saw the docile Bella and the tag saying reward, Teresa took Bella, who, trusting sweetie, came willingly. Flatly, Teresa said, got your dog, I need $500. Jessica, so relieved, suppressed anger and quickly said, okay. Teresa responded, you answer too fast, a thousand, take it or leave it, I can get two grand for it. Jessica, now educated, feigned tears, waited, and murmured, that'll wipe me out, but okay, where should we meet? They met in a remote warehouse district with Bella in Teresa's arms. Jessica tearfully ran to Bella, not so fast, we forgot about the $300 sales tax, 1300 bucks or I sell her. Jessica, suppressing anger, said, Honestly, I, I, I don't have it. I took the thousand from the bank. Go to the ATM! Jessica returned with the extra $300 and counted out $1,300, whereupon Teresa took the money and handed Bella back to Jessica. Teresa laughed. I would have taken 50 bucks. Maybe I should take a poker. Anyway, that story is Dog Stolen Reward. The next story is called An Old Wolf Talks to Us. There once was a wolf who had always been the smartest and meanest in the pack. For example, he won the Lone Wolf Award for killing the most sheep solo. No wolf pack, 23 sheep. But while attempting his greatest feat, trying to down a cow solo in the November of his years, the farmer shot the wolf, rendering him a paraplegic. The wolf speaks to us now from his den. I feel pretty good about how I've lived my life. I've lived up to my lupine potential. Sure, occasionally I felt a little sad for the sweet sheepies. 
I recognize they're nicer animals than I am, but I can't be what I'm not. My genes consign me to be an apex predator. Of course, I too am prey. Bears love us. Tigers order us for their main course, and then there are the humans. I can't really blame people. After all, our main course is their livestock, their livelihood. And so it goes. Now I wait out my days, <coughs> wolfing down easy prey. Old or sick mice, rats, rabbits, and my favorite, deer. And I spend a lot of time thinking. My favorite thought is that I'm not that far removed from a dog. Ah, dog's life, stretched out, snuggling warm and completely safe in a human's bed, and then only when I feel like it I get up and not have to fight for food, but just look longingly at my person who always responds by filling my bowl. Yes, dogs actually have a bowl for their food, with nuggets perfectly tailored to their dietary needs and preferences. I also wonder if there's wolf heaven with the pearly gates not manned, but of course wolfed. Would I get into heaven? Maybe killing so many sheep make me a bad wolfie, and then it would be down to wolf hell, where I'd never get to eat anything better than old sick mice. But mainly, I just feel sorry for myself. I can't believe that I lost out to a truly inferior wolf for the three little pigs gig. I could have blown that damn house down and I would have been famous, not just a big bad wolf, the biggest baddest wolf. But here I sit in my cave, just another old woulda, coulda, shoulda. What would I come back as? I think I'd want to come back as a gentle human being. I would adopt a dog from a shelter and be really nice to it and to everyone else. Oh, that's just a silly fairy tale. I think I'll just go and try to find me an old deer. Anyway, that story is a wolf talks to us, an old wolf talks to us. And then that's, those are from my book, Dark, as I said, short, short stories about the dark side of life. Um, the last uh, stories I want to read, I think there are three, are from the book Senior Stories about older people, lighter stories and darker stories. First story is a light one. It's called Knitting. After I got laid off at age 70, I tried to find work but could get no better than a part-time minimum wage job as a library page. Despite years of psychotherapy, meditation, mindfulness, and so on, I found that the only way to keep my anxiety under control was to stay busy, distracting attention from my real and my imagined woes. I was never an athlete and had no desire, for example, to take up golf, that staging area for the hereafter. Nor did I want to attend activities at the senior center, that would, too, acknowledge my place on life's conveyor belt. Watch more TV? Waste of time. I like to be productive, but at what? I never was artsy, so other cliches were out. For example, the old man at his easel, or wandering around with an outsized zoom lens, creating the zillionth image of nature's eye candy. I flashed on my mother knitting a sweater. Too hard, too feminine. Can you just see me in a knitting circle? So I dismissed the idea. But knitting kept intruding. It's too hard. I'm retarded at visualizing. Maybe if it was just a scarf. That's just a rectangle. No changed angles. Maybe I should watch a YouTube video. And I did, but couldn't even get the basic knit and purl move. If I took a knitting class, it would be embarrassing. Not just being a man, but I'd be so bad at it. Should I hire a tutor? I'm sure some little old lady would come to my house. No, we'd have to meet in a on a park bench. She might think I'm a rapist or something. I thought about placing an ad for a tutor on Craigslist, but figured that little old ladies who knit are more likely to see an ad that was a flyer hung on some yarn store's bulletin board. I went to three knitting stores. Two had bulletin boards, and the other allowed me to tape my ad to the cash register counter. Not so old man, inept with crafty things, wants to see if he can learn to knit. Seeking a patient tutor, 510-122-2376. I returned home to find a message on my answering machine. Yeah, I still use an answering machine. Not because I don't understand how to set up voicemail, but because I like to screen calls. Hello, I'm Marty Anderson. The owner of A Good Yarn phoned me to say that you were looking for someone to show you how to knit. You're welcome to come to my apartment. I thought... Well, there are four widows for every widower. Maybe she's eager. 
Feminist assertiveness has reached the senior set. And so I went to Maudie's apartment, where I saw why perhaps she might have been forward. She's bedridden with MS. I was slow to pick up even basic knitting moves, but Maudie was indeed patient. In showing me, increasingly she seemed to hold my hand just a fraction of a second longer than required. And then one time she held it for a full second. I looked her in the eye, then reminded I was on her bed, turned away, until once I didn't. And Marty and I met weekly for <coughs> knitting lessons. Before long, I had made four scarves and sewed a label in each, made with love by Albert and Marty. The next story is called Sam's Last Concert. In the wings, Sam could hear the concertmaster tuning up the orchestra. Damn, my hand is shaking more than usual. It's a bad Parkinson's day. Plus, it's my last concert. I'm nervous. Glad I decided to do the Grieg, but with these hands, nothing is easy. Sam had been a concert pianist his whole life. At age 11, he finished fourth in the Midwest Regional Young Artists Competition, and now at age 83, had performed 45 concerts, including one with the Kansas City Symphony. He thought, True, that was just in the KC Symphony Summer Festival when lots of the A players were on vacation, but still. <laughs> Somehow I wish my ex-wife were here. How could she have dumped me? I still wish she were here tonight. Hmm. Do I play it safe tonight? A lot of note mistakes would make the audience think I stayed at it too long, like those star baseball players who would rather hit 200 than retire. Or do I go for a home run? A chance at a write-up in the Kansas City Star. Roseman finishes with a flourish. The conductor gave Sam a forced smile, and Sam strode on stage. This is it. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Damn, my hands are shaking more. I'm taking too long. i got to get out there. Stand up straight, old man hunch. Stride, don't shuffle. But Sam could manage only to shuffle on stage. He hung onto the piano with one hand as he bowed his head to the audience. If I tried to bow from the waist, I could fall, he thought. And he sat down at the piano. I've had this moment so many times, but this is different. Sam used his old trick of adjusting the seat up and then back down again, not because it needed adjusting, but to buy a little more time to ground himself before the moment of truth. And Sam began and took every reasonable risk he could, and most of the time he won. Yes, his boldness caused a few note mistakes, but only the ignorant or mean-spirited could criticize his exciting performance. It was inspiring at any age, but for an 83-year-old with advanced Parkinson's, it gives me the chills just to tell you about it. And yes, Sam got not just the usual obligatory extended applause, bestowed as much to protest classical music's dying popularity as to acknowledge the performer, but fervent applause. And then, yes, a standing ovation. Not a charity ovation, a heartfelt one. And Sam, who usually was too shy to look at the applauding audience and so would stare at the back wall, soaked in the smiling standing people. Then he sighed and plodded off stage for what he thought was the last time. Sam shuffled into his dressing room, closed the door, and dropped into a chair. Ah, oh, I survived. I didn't embarrass myself. But I can't go to the reception. That's like a retirement party where everyone tries to make light of it being the beginning of the end. My end. There was a knock on the door. Daddy! His daughter opened the door and gushed. You were amazing! You really were amazing! Come on, they're all waiting for you! Sam knew there was no avoiding it, so he trudged downstairs. When he arrived, the chatter morphed into applause. He thought, no one likes long speeches and... Nothing ungracious. I should be a good boy. But he couldn't resist saying what he really felt. Honestly, I can't stand the thought this will be my last performance. And he teared up. Then a four-year-old toddled up to him. Do you want to play in my class? And Sam Roseman went on to play more concerts than he had in his entire life. In preschools and elementary schools, first just locally and then around the country. Sam never got paid. Indeed, he had to pay his travel expenses, but didn't begrudge it. I can't think of a better way to spend my money 
than to teach kids to love classical music and that old people aren't necessarily irrelevant. The last story I want to read you is called The Hillcrest Widow Club. The four women of the Hillcrest Widow Club met every Thursday morning at nine in the corner of a quiet coffee shop. Their statements about their deceased husbands started politely. For example, Mary said, yes, it's difficult, but I'm trying to muddle through. But slowly, their fear of being seen as cold faded. But what really opened things up was when Zoe said, honestly, I'm relieved to be rid of that ball and chain. Brittany then felt free to pile on. Don't we like talking with each other more than with men? We care more about family, feelings, okay, fashion. The successful men mainly want to talk about their work, the unsuccessful ones about stupid sports. Further emboldened, so we said. And they just care about getting in and out, assuming they can get it up, which for the last decade my husband couldn't. And I had to pretend it was okay. Two of the other women nodded. That encouraged Zoe to admit that she had fantasies about lesbian sex. Okay, more than fantasies. Before long, they decided they needed more privacy, so they met in Zoe's plush living room. Mary asked, how could you afford this? And Zoe replied, my husband was a lawyer who had one client, but a great one, the Environmental Protection Agency. After a glass of wine or a bong hit, Zoe moved close to Willow, the member who seemed most likely to be willing to kiss. Zoe looked her in the eye, and when Willow didn't avert, Zoe kissed her as the others watched wide-eyed. Would Willow pull back? On the contrary, she sighed in pleasure. But Zoe sensed it was too fast, not just for Willow, but for the others. So Zoe pulled back and asked if someone would like another hit or a glass of wine. But three Zoe meetings later, they all, and I mean all, had a very cuddly experience. But after, Mary whispered something that shocked the others. I love our widow's club, but every so often I wonder, are men so bad that we're fine with bashing them? I mean, we wouldn't criticize women, let alone BIPOCs. If I did, I'd get the three C's. Censure, censor, or cancel. Atop that, in so many news shows, and especially movies, TV shows, and novels, a spunky, smart woman triumphs over an evil or clueless guy. And when women have the deficit, say we're so-called underrepresented in science, there's massive redress and, yes, reverse discrimination. I know a number of women who got jobs over more competent, harder-working guys. Okay, so did I. Yet, when men have the ultimate deficit, they live six years shorter than women. Their last decade in worse health, there are 4.4 widows for every widower. All we see is another run for breast cancer. Over the next few meetings, the others began to shun Mary. It was subtle, a little less eye contact, a little more interrupting, and unlike before, no one asked her to get together between meetings. Sad at being ostracized, Mary figured that it isn't a big deal to play the game. She even told anti-male jokes. What do you call a man with half a brain? Gifted? What's the difference between government bonds and men? Bonds mature. What's the difference between a man and a catfish? One is a bottom-feeding scum sucker, and the other is a fish. And soon, Mary was back in the fold. Those stories come from the book Senior Stories. The earlier stories that I've read to you come from the book Dark. In any event, I thank you for watching. As usual, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. And certainly welcome your checking out any of my books or short, short stories that are all are available on Amazon. Uh, just search on my name, Marty Nemco, and, and on Amazon and you'll, you'll see all 27 of my books. In any event, I do thank you for watching. Uh, I like to end all my podcasts with a, a quote that I believe is more, it's not for me, it's from a guy named Frank Clark, that feels more apropos today than ever in my lifetime. We find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't.